Hey guys, how's it going? So, I was in the middle of making a video about the science fiction programming of our reality with regard to space and dinosaurs and nuclear weapons, and I stumbled upon this web page that I was going to use in the video, but there are two images in particular that I wanted to dissect, so I figured I would just make a quick video about this. And the title of the page is The Timeline of Images of Earth Before 1969. And it is very interesting. When you scroll through, you can see they start in 1350 with this Genesis story picture. And then you have the 1400. Guy with an arrow shoots the Earth, which is the elements. And then the 1542, which interestingly enough has the Earth in the center of the universe with the realms of water, air, and fire below the spheres of the moon, planets, and stars. So that one's kind of interesting as well. And then 1665, you have the Jesuit creation there, and the Jesuits get busy, I suppose. And then 1834, this one's also interesting. Geologist attempts the first representation of Earth as a cosmic object in space. Darn, that looks pretty good. It looks like the stuff that NASA uses. So they probably just took his 1834 image and turned that into the blue marble. And then in 1880, we have this image of the Earth. This is actually the Earth rise from the moon. And it's so interesting how they program this stuff in the 1880s, and then what do we get from NASA but the Earth rise from the moon when they act like they're actually doing it? They take the science fiction and they turn it into science, supposedly. And this image was by this gentleman, this Frenchman, Camille Flammarion, and he is the one who created the illustration of the, uh, the figure who is peeking out through the firmament. I'm sure you've seen it in the a lot of flat earth videos. So that was done by this gentleman and he also has a lot of very interesting illustrations in his um, works from the 1800s. So that's what I was actually doing in my other video and he was a big part of it. So uh, just moving along here quickly so I can get to the images I wanted to dissect. Um, 1902 again we have the the earth rise so pathetic the programming here. Um, 1918, this Wallach Law, however you pronounce his name. Um, and, and then we come to the 1946 V2 rocket shot, which this could actually be a, a legit photograph from a balloon or that V2 rocket they claim it was taken from. Either way, it doesn't really matter. It shows a flat horizon anyways. Uh, this 1956 National Geographic artist production here. Looks just like the blue marble. We'll skip that. So again, you can see the programming is so pathetic. The science fiction, the artists' renditions, they have everything that they just make up in the 1700s, 1800s, and then it magically is reality in the 1900s. So the, um, the first image here, the 1960 first television picture from space, the Tyros-1 satellite, April 1st, 1960. Well... The problem is, um, well, I'll get to the problem in a second, but this satellite designed to obtain cloud pictures was rocketed into space aboard a Thor Able launch vehicle on April 1st, 1960 from Cape Canaveral, Florida. The satellite was basically a cylinder with 18 flattened sides to mount solar panel cells or solar power cells. The satellite was approximately 42 inches in diameter, 22 inches high, including the projecting television camera lens, and had a launch weight of approximately 283 pounds, including fuel for small solid rockets to control the satellite's spin over time. Yes, folks, they could remotely control the spin of a satellite that is 400 miles in the vacuum of space. Wow, that's pretty pathetic. The point I wanted to make with this satellite is that it is only 400 miles up, the horizon at 400 miles is only 1,800 miles away. You wouldn't even be able to see Europe if you were over Florida. I mean, this picture is ridiculous. It is a fake. This is not a real picture. The Earth's edges, the edges of the spinning ball Earth, would not be visible at 400 miles up. The horizon is only 1,800 miles. If you were on the ball Earth, you would need to see 6,000 miles in each direction 
to see the edges of the ball earth. You know, that we, they tell us the circumference, 25,000 miles in circumference. That means if you're looking at half of the ball earth, you're looking at 12,000 miles. That means if you're exactly, you're always on top of the ball earth. So all around you, in order to see the entire earth, you would have to be able to see about 6,000 miles in each direction. And that means in order to be high enough to see that far, I actually did the calculations and you would have to be about 4,000 miles into space. So in order to see the entire Earth, you need to be about 4,000 miles in space. So any picture, any image you see where they show you the bendy Earth and you see the whole Earth or half the Earth, it's fake. You would only, it wouldn't look much different than when you look out of an airplane and you see the horizon all around you, you, you would still see a horizon all around you until you get to 4,000 miles. Then you would actually see the edges of the ball. Until then, you're just seeing the edges that are still going down, but they're not to the limit of the, you know, half of the circumference. If that makes any sense. I don't even know if that makes sense. But all I know is you can't see the edges of the ball unless you can see 6,000 miles in each direction. The description of this sucker here... The main sensors that provided the cloud pictures were television cameras. The Tyros cameras were slow-scan devices that take snapshots of the scene below. One snapshot was taken every 10 seconds. These were rugged, lightweight devices weighing only about 4.5 pounds, including the camera lens. The Tyros 1 was equipped with two cameras. One had a wide-angle lens providing views that were approximately 750 miles on a side. Uh, with the satellite looking straight down, and a narrow angle camera with a view that was about 80 miles on a side. So when the satellite was within range of a ground station, the cameras could be commanded remotely to take a picture every 10 or 30 seconds. But each camera was also connected to a clock-controlled tape recorder to record images when the satellite was beyond the range of a ground station. So it was set up to automatically do this. Each recorder contained 400 feet of tape and could record up to 32 pictures for playback the next time the satellite was in range. But this is just ridiculous. So this thing had 400 feet of tape. <laughs> if you've ever messed with tape, what a pain. In the vacuum of space, operated remote via remote control 400 miles away, and we believe this stuff. So there were two data acquisition stations, command and data acquisition stations used for the Tyros or the Tyros 1. These were, I'm sorry if I'm talking quickly, <laughs> I'm sure this is boring so I want to get through it. These were located at the Army Signal Corps Laboratory in Belmore, New Jersey and the Air Force facility at Kayana Point, Hawaii. A third station used for engineering and backup was located at the RCA plant where the Tyros was built in Hightstown, New Jersey. So. Now get this, when the satellite data was read out at either of the CDA stations, it was recorded on 35mm film for making prints and large projections. From these, a hand-drawn cloud analysis was made, then transmitted by fax to the U.S. Weather Bureau National Meteorological Center near Washington, D.C. So, <laughs> I don't get why they have to draw these by hand if they have the pictures, but... Oh, it's just so ridiculous. It was not until 1962 that some of the actual gridded satellite pictures were sent via fax to um, the National Meteorological Center and some other large weather bureau offices. So, I don't even know what to think of this. It's just ridiculous. During the 77 days it operated, the satellite sent back 19,389 usable pictures that were used in weather operations. It transmitted remotely... 400 miles through the vacuum of space and through the entire atmosphere. I mean, I can't even get my Wi-Fi to work when I go outside of my house. And these guys are transmitting data from tape cassettes to and from the Earth. 400 miles difference in low Earth orbit. And it's orbiting. It's not. A, this was not a geostationary satellite. This thing was actually orbiting. Beyond this satellite, we have the ATS-3. This one is also a pathetic joke, because this satellite, operated by NASA from 1967 until 2001, they claim it was in geostationary orbit. 
22,000 miles. Then, so this is in 1967, and we're supposed to believe that they magically sent a rocket flying through the vacuum of space until it reaches the magical limit of 22,000 miles, and then it stops in its tracks. And it stays there for 34 years, because even though they claim that it was operated only until 2001, supposedly it's still up there. Um, you can actually track the satellite. It is, it's just to the west of Central America. Here's the other very strange thing about this satellite, is they claim that it is it's not being used by NASA, but it is still being used by the Antarctic mission. The Palmer Station in Antarctica currently uses this satellite from 1967. And you can see here, they, <laughs> they say this satellite is now still being used for order wire voice, this is one of the services, public telephone, and point-to-point -point data transfer, remote hosts slash internet access. What in the world <laughs> are people thinking? This satellite was launched in 1967. The internet was not even... No, I'm sorry. 1967 technology does not enable you to use the internet 34 years later. That is just ridiculous. That is a Santa Claus story. That is a pink unicorn on a rainbow story. They're claiming that they're using the internet on a satellite from a satellite that was launched in 1967 and was decommissioned by NASA. They quit using it in... 2001. Um, yeah, that is just insane. I don't even know what to say about that. It's just ridiculous. So, you can see right here, they say they get two hours minimum per day contact with this satellite. Um, link quality, port affair, variable due to the ionosphere. Let's look at the comments. Shared with South Pole and LMG, problems with multipath signals from the ocean, and the ionospheric disruptions to signal, yeah, to the balloon, I guess. You're talking about the balloons you launch all the time. Ugh, that is horrible. At the South Pole Station, approximately 13 hours a day of connectivity exists using four satellites. The ATS-3 is one, blah, blah, blah. Now, about this photo, they claim this photo of Earth was taken November 10th, 1967. And the camera used the spin of the satellite to scan the Earth. 2,400 revolutions of the satellite, spinning at about two revolutions per second, were needed to produce one complete image of Earth. So gravity is strong enough to keep it in, to keep it stationary. At 22,000 miles, our tractor beam of gravity can stop that satellite magically, but it can't stop it from spinning, apparently. So it'll stop it at 22,000 miles, but if you spin it, it'll spin forever. That's how the tractor beam works. It has an imaginary axis out there that it just spins around. Magic. It is just total magic. Wow. So, mounted aboard the spin-stabilized satellite from 1967, the camera scanned a small strip of the Earth with each rotation, and by tilting the camera slightly for the next rotation with the magic motor on board, an image of Earth could be created in about 20 minutes. So there you have it, folks. 1967, they launch a satellite that magically gets caught in the Earth's tractor beam at 22,000 miles up in geostationary orbit. I mean, it's so ridiculous. By the time it even got to 22,000 miles, I mean, the Earth would be in a different location. <laughs> How long would that thing even take to get there? I'm not sure, but... I mean, it would have to be going semi-slow to slow down at 22,000 miles and stop. The Earth is spinning and moving on its orbit. I don't know how it it just magically catches, in it, catches it in its tractor beam, but it is able to spin itself even in the tractor beam, and it's spin-stabilized magically, and it has power for spin thrust, and it has power to send images 22,000 miles. It has power to communicate with the Earth 22,000 miles away and act as a giant Wi-Fi station for the Arctic missions in the South Pole. It's a telephone operator. It is, like I said, Wi-Fi. It's voice and data. 
I'm, I'm kind of speechless. I'm sorry this video is sort of rambling, but I'm, I'm kind of speechless just making the video. Like I said, I just took a break from researching my you know, f science fiction programming of our reality, and when you just do a tiny bit of research and ponder logically what they claim these things are doing from 1967, I mean, what in the world are we thinking? I, I wish it was real. I wish it were real. I wish... I wish we could believe this stuff, but I cannot bring my brain to logically accept some of these stories, some of these claims made. It just, it defies all logic and all reason to accept these phony baloney stories from magical pink unicorn on a rainbow land. I don't know what else to say about it, guys. Anyways, so that's it. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you think. Do you find this as ridiculous as I do? Am I missing something? It makes no sense to me. It just sounds like a fantastic child story. So thanks so much for watching. Everyone have a great day. Adios.